for a daily roundup of the latest international and local top stories. Politics is not everybody's cup of tea. In Pakistan, politics has endless possibilities. Politics is the art of the possible. But we have got you covered. Debate for in-depth analysis. and insight. Watch Politics Today every Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday at 9.05 p.m. with me, Farukh Pita. is life book is hope and book is light for the future What is the real Pakistani society about? What are our beliefs and what are our aspirations? Reflecting the true picture of our otherwise misunderstood Pakistani society. Reality versus perception. Where do we see our place in the global society? Join me, Papa Shaheen, in rediscovering the real Pakistani society.
It Assalamu alaikum to everybody who's tuned into PTV World and watching World this morning. Nonsense, very fantastic, amazing, superb, intelligent, and the very warm Miss Shiza Hashmi. And I happen to be Shazad Hassan Khan. Ladies and gentlemen, we hope and pray that everybody out there is ready to get started with us today on World this morning. But first things first, since it's raining outside and it's a very cold Wednesday, we're here in Islamabad. So let me ask my colleague. Hello, Shiza. How are you doing on a rainy day in Islamabad? Thank you so much for asking. I'm doing great. While yes, I am so, so, so cold. Oh, my God. I had to th think thrice before coming to work today because it was so cold, right? Really? Yes, but uh, while, of course, I enjoy doing my work, so I had to. But then I was like, I have to manage this cold. There's no way this is going to stop me from doing things, right? Yeah, yeah. So, again, I was wearing at least three to four layers of clothes under my, you know, the main outfit and whatnot. And then I was doing my coffee and my makeup and everything right in front of the heater and everything. So, well, I did sort of manage it. And now I feel like my body temperatures are under control. <laughs> what well, about you? That's How are wonderful. you liking it? I, I think I've been feeling cold because, you know, while you're driving, obviously, you cannot wear your suit jacket ah. as well. So... You know, you just have to really drive with your dress suit on. Right. And so that's what I was doing. But as soon as you get out of the car and you're walking into the office, that's the time when you really feel the chill and you're like, dude, where am I? I but swear. as a matter of fact, I think everybody's kind of enjoying the weather. You know, it's raining in Karachi as well. It's raining in Peshawar. It's raining in Islamabad. So it's technically the rain season, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, it's just that, that, you know, I cannot get enough of uh, sunshine or sunlight as well. So, and which is something which I really truly depend on so i feel I a little low uh, just because of the fact that i haven't seen the sun in a longer time now and yes mr sun we truly miss you over here as well oh. but other than that we definitely hope and pray that everybody is doing great because ladies and gentlemen today on the 5th of january 2021 it's a very important day 22 and to correct you yes 2022 <laughs> yes and that's the uh, correction which i think everybody kind of even me everybody kind of needs as well because usually when i used to go to school i used to write the previous year you know, on, on your uh, copy, you actually used to write the date and then, oh, ma'am, sorry, you know, we made a mistake. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, 5th of January 2022 or may it be 2021 or any other year as well, mm. it is as important as it will be the previous year or this year as well, till the time that we find a resolve for our Kashmiri brethren. Absolutely. Thank you so much for saying that, Shazad. And I think you couldn't have said it better. Where even if it's 21 or 22 for that matter, it's been more than 70 years now that our Kashmiri brethren who were alongside us fighting for, you know, the freedom of our entire nation, they are, I mean, I want to say they're not at the same page as us, of course, True. because we are now a sovereign and independent state, but they are still not. Uh, in that particular geographical region where now our Kashmiri brethren exist, it is it is called an illegally Indian-occupied okay, right. Kashmir. That is because of, well, for more than 70 years, we have been seeing the kind of atrocities going on over there, illegal occupation. Imagine, you know, forces just landing into a geographical zone and just occupying a land, occupying the people, resources and everything for so many decades. And it's still going on. But it's not that it went un it's not that it went unseen or ignored Shazad. It was probably just one or two years into the independence itself in forty nine when actually the United Nations, the then newborn international organization, actually said or rather declared or passed a resolution that a plebiscite is going to be held in mm. Kashmir, where all the people residing over there at that time are going to be the ones voting for to choose either if they want to be a part of the then India or the Pakistan or to be an autonomous Kashmir itself. Okay. Now, with such a promise back in 1949, we, we don't see the realization. It's 2022 and it's just absolutely so unfortunate, so sad. Our heart goes out to all our Kashmiri brethren, always politically, diplomatically, emotionally, we are with you. Uh, before we move on, Shazad, I think we should share a small informative report with all of you out there. I think before, <laughs> Shazad, we actually do that, we really need to kind of uh, give uh, some kind of awareness to all of those people who tuned in as well. Because we go out in 46 yes. different countries, 
we are pretty sure that you know within this region you know south asian region pretty much everybody knows about how vulturistic india has been and how Absolutely. you know their human rights have been kind of violated every single day as well hmm. but today ladies and gentlemen it actually happens to be and we are observing it as well it happens to be yom e haq e khud iradiyat or probably right to self determination yes. as well where the kashmiri people actually make sure that they're going to protest in front of the united nations as well and kind of talk about that plebiscite that how you know they have still been violating uh, violated by india as well and then for all of the articles which have been taken away from within the constitution maybe maybe 370 but other than that i think one more thing which we really need to add over here is that a lot of international organizations who kind of voice that they are going to come down to a solution or bring a solution for mm. the indian illegally occupied jammu and kashmir as well but it has not happened so far so before we kind of share the video i think it's really important to build a narrative where we share with the people how much important this day is 5th Absolutely. of january 2022 and what is the way forward and to kind of do so mm. we very lucky ladies and gentlemen that we've actually been joined by somebody who happens to be the international media coordinator of chairman apc he is Mr Baba Mukhtar hello sir assalam alaikum good morning wa alaikum assalam very good morning thank uh, you very much sir for joining us thank you for us. having me here thank you very much thank sir for joining you. us wonderful to have you and i believe that you're the most apt guest today to kind of speak about the right to self determination as well and alongside baba mukhtar ladies and gentlemen we were lucky that we've actually been joined by the chairperson united jammu kashmir coalition and she happens to be a human rights activist a very amazing speaker i think that whenever she kind of speaks she always makes sense backed by logic and this is something which i think international media likes the most as well so you know to make more sense ladies and gentlemen without any further ado i'm going to introduce her she happens to be miss sundas malik hello assalam alaikum good morning how are you ji <laughs> assalam alaikum thank you for having us on such an important day thank you very uh, much for joining and uh, it's always a pleasure to be here thank you very much wonderful so you know i think first things first what we really need to do is that we really need to go back in time when you know where she's actually spoke about 1949 or the plebiscite needed to happen and then it did happen but it really didn't come out of uh, a lot of value for the people living in indian illegally occupied jammu and kashmir as well so baba mukhtar i would want you to kind of speak about you know the historical facts of the plebiscite and then we'll come down to what's happening in 2022 thank you very much uh, firstly i want to correct uh, what your co-host said that uh, in the plebiscite uh, there are Uh, what it call either you have to go with india pakistan or some sort of uh, what autonomous. it called uh, autonomous say it's yeah. not that okay so the uh, 5th january 1949 resolution says that you have to choose it is it and and the very important thing is that it's not a right of self determination it's a right of plebiscite so united nation resolution says that there should be a democratic method hmm. to choose between india and pakistan through a impartial and fair plebiscite yeah so okay. that means that either you have to choose because the the kashmir issue is the what it called the left over of the partition mm. so we have we have to decide whether we have to go with pakistan or we have to go with uh, uh, india so that we we have to uh, the right to vote in favor of only there are only two options in right. the 5th january 1949 resolution and subsequent resolutions they two uh, and the very important thing is there is in any resolution i believe it is 18 resolutions have been passed uh, on the different occasions but uh, there is no what it uh, what uh, uh, she said mm-hmm. that autonomous uh, yeah so it's not at, uh, something like that it just between india and pakistan right. so that uh, in uh, 5th january f- uh, uh, ni- 1949 that uh, they 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 made a com- commission with uh, U- united states of america belgium argentina czechoslovakia they were the members of uh, what it called that uh, commission which is called india pakistan commission for india and pakistan so the the very uh, the very important is that we have to understand this that we have to set the vocabulary to build our narrative True. because the it's plebiscite be- either india or pakistan no no nothing more than that and nothing less than that so that's that's what the 5th uh, uh, january 1949 resolution is right, sir but while i was actually looking into the historical facts and thank you very much we truly stand corrected as a team as well and uh, 
you know, this is something which Pakistanis might think that, you mm -hmm. know, okay, you know, because Kashmiris uh, happen to be our brethren, may it be in the Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir, we truly want that, yeah, it's whatever is good for them, you know, yes. they should actually get to decide that. But when we talk about today, sir, in particular, or Yawm-e Haqe Khudirati, I think this is the day to remind United Nations that, you know, that the re resolution which was passed should actually be seen in terms of very practical ways. But that's something which is missing. And this is something we need to do today. So to build a narrative for today, I think the narrative should be that UN should be reminded of the resolution they have passed that, hey, sir, you know, you really need to kind of think about because it's so many years down the line that nothing has happened. Please. Yes, uh, to be very honest, it is uh, 74th year that uh, uh, from the 1947 uh, uh, that uh, the genesis of uh, the conflict is uh, in the partition. We have, we have to understand that. And the very important is the uh, the uh, the uh, what, what it called the United Nations resolution. They have adopted not only one, two, three. They have adopted at least eighty resolutions for the Kashmir. But the very important is India is always trying to make uh, what it called the arguments that we have done the Shimla agreement, Sabotage. we have done this, they are sabotaging, uh, they, uh, we have done the Tashkand agreement, which is not true because no bilateral agreement will undo the what it called United Nations resolution. And thank you very much sir for saying that as well because this is exactly what I want Ms. Sundas to kind of speak about as well and this is something which is projected by India again and again. So what's your take on this? Well. Uh, when we talk about projection, and in the same sentence we use India, we know that uh, we are dealing with uh, a malicious campaign sure. against specifically the people of Kashmir. Uh, as far as uh, their uh, hue and cry of having bilateral agreements in the form of Karachi agreement or Shimla agreement or whatsoever, uh, Mukhtar Baba Sab correctly mentioned that uh, Article 103 of uh, the United Nations uh, Charter uh, explains that no bilateral agreement can ever supersede uh, a UN uh, resolution. Right. So, n number one, let's get that fact straight. And number two, when we talk about um, the ideology of self-determination, you're very correct in mentioning that this ideology only resides in the minds and hearts of the people of Pakistan. They're the only one who are interested in the freedom of Kashmir by any mean possible. True. And the, uh, the most uh, important thing when you spoke of an autonomous uh, position for the people of Kashmir, it is only provided in the constitution of Pakistan, which uh, gives the people of Kashmir uh, uh, the freedom uh, to choose whether they want to be a separate state, whether they want to be a province, or whether they want to be uh, to have um, uh, autonomy uh, as a sovereign country, uh, when and if they t decide to accede to uh, <coughs> the state of Pakistan. So I think it is very important to get that narrative right for the people who believe that uh, self-determination is a right. Uh, it is also important to understand that 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 right can only be provided to them by a country which best uh, safeguards their interest, uh, i.e. Pakistan. And, course, and thank you very much for saying that because in addition to that, I'm very sorry that I might be putting you in a hard position as of now with the, the question which I'm about to ask. But as a matter of fact, we have seen this over the years that, you know, may it be United Nations, may it be any other organization, may it be human rights activists or human rights active uh, WIS organization as well, working for the people of Indian illegally occupied Kashmir as well. The question is, why do you think that we have failed for so long in making sure that, you know, that their right to self-determination gets to them or they get their right, which is underlined in the Constitution? While definitely, Sundas, I want you to talk about this in detail, I think I want you to hold that thought because right now I ha we have the report that we want to share with you. Let's look at the numbers and the stats of what's going on over there. And when we come back, we'll definitely continue our discussion. 5th of January 1949 was a historic day in the history of Kashmir as on this day the international community accepted the importance of recognising the basic human rights of Kashmiri people. Kashmiri people through a resolution passed on this day.
January the 5th marks the day when Kashmiris all over the world gather to commemorate their right to choose their own fates. It is the day when they ask all the civilised nations of the world to understand their cause, the pain that they have suffered for it and the struggle that they are not willing to give up. The issue of Kashmir was first taken to the United Nations Security Council on January the 1st, 1948, where the United Nations, European Union, OIC and other international institutions adopted a principled position when the Kashmir question first came before the UN Secretary-General, voting in support of resolutions of 1948 and 1949, upholding the right of people of Kashmir to decide their future in a free and impartial plebiscite under the UN auspices. But since then, due to India's rigidity, this issue is still unresolved and one of the oldest unresolved issues of the United Nations. Efforts of the Prime Minister Imran Khan in this issue of Kashmir are highly appreciatable. He shook the world while addressing the UNGA, representing the fact regarding Kashmir fearlessly. 100,000 Kashmiris have died in the past 30 years because they were denied the right given by the United Nations. The right for self-determination. 100,000 have died and 11,000 women have been raped. There are two human rights, United Nations human rights reports on this. The world hasn't done anything. There seems to be a concerted effort to break the will of the Kashmiris who have continued to face the tragedies of occupation for over 70 years. In these times when India has suffocated the living for Kashmiris, the time has come when international communities should play its role and scrutinise India to respect the basic human rights of Kashmiris and arrange the implementation of the 5th of January resolution so that the Kashmir dispute could be settled in accordance with the Kashmiris' aspirations. So I believe me and my Prime Minister are on the same page because he asked the same question as well. So Ms. Sundas, what do you have to say? Well, I think uh, it, it would be injustice to uh, call it uh, a, a single-pronged uh, solution. There, there are, I think, a lot of factors uh, which not only the people of uh, Kashmir have faced in the past 74 years, but our greatest ally, Pakistan itself, not, I wouldn't even call it an ally, our only hope uh, the backlash and the rhetoric and the disinformation and the instability efforts that have come Pakistan's way uh, as a result of their uh, support for Kashmir, I think uh, it would be uh, uh, not well uh, uh, informed. Uh, it would be coming out of an uh, ill-informed mind if we say that Pakistan has not suffered um, as a result mm. of its uh, work on Kashmir. But I think it is also very important to understand that uh, difference of opinion uh, in certain matters, such as this, uh, um, the, the uh, issue of Kashmir, uh, can lead us down to this rabbit hole that we have been in for the past 74 mm. years. Uh, whereas uh, I find many people from Pakistan sometimes asking me what the people of Kashmir want, what is their demand. Well, I, I think it is very important to clarify here today that I, I, uh, I'm very confident when I speak for, and when I say that I speak for the majority of the people of not only Azad Kashmir, but of the occupied valley, when I say that there is no doubt in our minds uh, that who we are. True. According to us, hum Pakistani hai, Pakistan hamara hai. True. And they, any other uh, argument is not soluble for the people of Kashmir. Uh, number two, as far as the Indian occupation is concerned, they have tried, um, as we have seen through history, their best to uh, not deliver what the Kash people of Kashmir have been promised and uh, uh, keep up with this false narrative of a secular you know, uh, country, which they clearly are not. And um, Alhamdulillah, I think it is uh, important to say here that I feel proud as a Kashmiri that uh, Allah has chosen us to uh, expose India as a fascist, genocidal, sec uh, settler, uh, colonialistic, apartheid state. True. We have shown the world that when it comes to the ideology of Jinnah Saab, when he said that the Muslims, uh, Muslim minority of India cannot survive in the, uh, with the authority of a Hindu majority, uh, I think it has been proven by Kashmir for the past 74 years. And it's even being, uh, it's even being proved in the India as well, where the Hindutva has been uh, kind of around as well for a longer period of time. Not just that, you know, there's 
so much bad news coming in in terms of Muslims when we talk about that too who reside in India. But let's not go over there. Obviously, you know, you know, for all of those people, Muslims worldwide, ladies and gentlemen, they are our brothers and sisters and we do care about them. But sir, now what I want to come down to is, I know, Shiza, that you have a question, but very quickly, because we are talking about the human rights violations. So imagine that from that, to be in that rabbit hole and then human rights violations, we've come down to a point where Indian illegally occupied Kashmir is under siege and that too, it's been more than one year as well and you know so there have been blackouts so and there the ethnic cleansing is going on over there people are not given the right to kind of work within where the places where they were working already you know people from outside India are actually coming in and making sure that they're settling over there with new jobs being offered to them so from human rights violation to violation of such an extent where are we headed and how do you think that this day will create that triple effect where inshallah the international community comes together to find a resolve to be very honest, I don't see them as human rights violations. All right. I see them as war crimes. True. So, but unfortunately, we have failed at this stage. Maybe uh, today, or as on date, uh, we but can. But we are not ho hopeless. So, so yes, 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 yes. We are not hopeless. So we are fighting Alhamdulillah. from last seventy-four uh, years, and uh, as a Kashmiri, I'm t uh, we are there from last uh, uh, thirty-two years fighting li uh, like anything. Mm -hmm. What I mean to say is that it's not uh, the human rights violations; it's the, the they are crime. the war crimes. So wh what we have to do uh, is being a Kashmiri, that uh, the, uh, the human rights, uh, uh, what it called the other bodies of uh, human rights. So we have to make India accountable for not the human rights True. for the war, war crimes crime. and and the dozier of uh, what it called past pakistan that is the eye opener for the world community the, how much they have uh, inflicted uh, what it called atrocities it's not only today it is from last 32 years mm -hmm. uh, january is the mass month of the massacres in uh, what it called occupied Kashmir. It is Handwara, it's Kafwara, it's uh, what it called Sopur, where hundreds of uh, what uh, the shops were uh, uh, set ablaze and the, at least uh, some uh, five, six dozen people were killed. So, and, and after that, in, uh, in the end of the January in 1990, uh, 1993, probably the Handwara massacre happened, then Kafwara massacre. And because because uh, we usually shut uh, the shops on the 26th of the, what they call that uh, the uh, 26th uh, January of India's Republic Day, we, we, that is Black Day for we people, we Kashmiris. So the next day on 27th, uh, they opened fire. Where everybody who sh over, uh, uh, opened the, his shop and they fired indiscriminately and killed 18 people uh, in the cold blood. Uh, so the very important is that we have to make it, that we have to come together as a, a Pakistan, the Kashmiris, and we have to tell, uh, because what I believe that uh, uh, it's unto the, the stories of Kashmir are untold. We have to tell the, our stories through the media, through the different channels that uh, what had happened in the last 32 years, that how thousands, hundred thousand people are, have been killed. There is a rape is a weapon of for the Indian uh, occupation. So, and, and the very important is that we are, we have to tell the world that it is that one million boots are on the ground mm -hmm. and it is the military occupation. It's not a simple occupation True. it's a military occupation and you will not find whether you will find you you, you see the the Afghanistan the Syria you you never find that one million boots on the True. ground and ev for every Kashmiri there is for for nine K Kashmiri there is one Once Indian soldier and uh, so it's very difficult uh, there and especially that after 5th August uh, uh, 2019 that they have made that Kashmir hell. They, you cannot speak, even you cannot even post a Facebook post about the atrocities, about sufferings of the people. So they, if, if you post, if you make a, a tweet, if you make a, what it called uh, the social media post, so you will be arrested under UAP, very stringent law. So you have to prove, prove yourself that you are not guilty. So it's such a such a uh, black law. So the very important is that the Hurriyat conference, as a uh, the amalgam of the uh, what it called the pro freedom parties. So 
they are trying their best to raise the voice of the oppressed people of Kashmir. Yeah. And recently, that after the, uh, the symbol of the Kashmir resistance, Sayyid Ali Gilani Al Rahma, who died in uh, what it called yeah. confinement, and uh, then they have made the Masrat Alam, the young 50 years uh, old, uh, 50 year old, uh, very young and dynamic, uh, what it called the icon, the resistance icon, uh, the chairman of AP. PIC. And under uh, the leadership of the Masrat Alam, so we hope that we will move forward and we will make our voice louder than anything uh, in the uh, world. Exactly. Absolutely. And we are totally with you. We 100% agree with everything you said. But you know, where we talk about atrocities, of course, everyone sort of realizes that. And it's also because of the internet and the non-traditional media lately that the reality of India, like you mentioned, Sundas, is definitely coming in front of everyone. True. But sir, where you mention about war crimes, there's no, we don't like throwing terms out. But it is for sure, if you go Google it or if you read about it, it is a war crime. It is, it is also ethnic cleansing, targeted genocide as well all these terms apply to the people but where we like you know where we like to say that I don't know when the UN is going to call it a war crime they're not the watchdog uh, organizations only tell you what to do they will never force it on you True. because they recognize occupation in the Geneva Convention they opened a whole chapter on occupation what to do what not to do but then uh, same way they do recognize war crimes but they're not going to come in and stop and due to the same reason Kashmir is one of the exa failure examples of the United Nations True. itself so if a very neat and clean process of democratic elections and things can be going on in Namibia and similar examples from the success stories of the United Nations, what do you think can be done or has not been done so far that the plebiscite hasn't been held? Uh, Sundas, let's start with you. Some of the solutions that the United Nations, similar organizations or international community can do to help with the plebiscite. Well, I think <clears throat> firstly it is very important for United Nations to recognize their duty yes. and it is even more important for us as uh, a population of 22 crore yeah. and then a population of 60 in AJK and 80 in uh, occupied Kashmir to ensure that UN realizes that it is an obligation. And that we remind them every single day. Number two, I think it is very important to understand that uh, life in India, even for human rights organizations, is not easy. Oh. As we know, very recently, Amnesty International had to leave India. It had to leave Indian soil due to the harassment and the um, threats that they were getting uh, while they were working on Kashmir. Mm -hmm. So I think these human rights organizations have the responsibility of reporting such uh, events to the United Nations mm. and imploring them uh, for action. Number three, I think it is Again, very important, like uh, uh, Mukhtar Saab said, um, Shah Mahmood Qureshi Saab mentioned very rightly, uh, people took it in the wrong manner also, but I think it is very important to understand that Article 370 is not as important as 35A, 35 35 because Absolutely. 35A is the article which uh, provides uh, th uh, the Indian government with the mechanism of demographic change. Mm -hmm. We know mm -hmm. that more than five more than five million domiciles have been issued to non-Kashmiris. And they're working towards, uh, like you said, how can the plebiscite come? They're bracing themselves for exactly. it. Mm -hmm. They preparing. know for a fact that this occupation cannot last. You know, occupation through intimidation is something 74 years for Kashmiris is at huge. this point immunized us mm -hmm. to uh, occupation. We do not think that sitting at home will achieve anything. 5th of January, we're sitting five days into the new year. We have already lost 12 brothers in occupied Kashmir uh, during armed struggle, which again, I would like to mention it through this platform, is a UN recognized legal mechanism for achieving the right of self-determination. Mm. The people of Kashmir have, have a legal right of uh, armed uh, resistance. Yes. So when they call them militants, we, we know they are freedom fighters. They're fighting not only for the uh, resolution of the Kashmir issue, but for the completion of Pakistan's independence itself. True. We're mm -hmm. a part of Pakistan according to its official map. Of so course. until Kashmir is free, Pakistan isn't free. Exactly. Our and independence is not complete. True. Yes. And thank you very much for saying that because this is uh, the way forward, ladies and gentlemen, and how this is how everybody needs to kind of come together as well. And you know where Ms. Sundas actually said, there are almost more than 5 million domiciles have actually been issued as well. 
which is why you know god forbid you if in days to come probably in years two years three years time if the plebiscite is going to take place you know how the tables are going to turn as well it's and the that's Indians what be the vulgaristic india is actually doing but as of now we really want to kind of thank our guests thank you very much babu mukta thank, thank you, you very much for on this to join us on this very special day as well where we gather together to make sure that we remind the world that hey you know you're supposed to do this and please make sure ladies and gentlemen that you play a role because while we are talking you know there's somebody who's been actually ripped off their human rights as well and as babu mukta said it's not a human right crime as well it is actually a war crime thank you very much for being with us but we do have more visuals to kind of give a better understanding to the international audience out there what is basically going on in indian illegally occupied jammu and kashmir and when you guys will come back we will kind of talk about how education can actually even help within that region and this region as well let's do this the status of jammu and kashmir is disputed since partition of the subcontinent and demands attention of world community for peaceful resolution for this seven decades long conflict according to the wishes of people of Jammu and Kashmir. It is an established fact that it was India which approached the United Nations for intervention. United Nations Security Council since then has passed various resolutions supporting the Kashmiris' right to self-determination. The resolution of 5th January 1949 reads, the question of accession of state of Jammu and Kashmir to India or Pakistan will be decided to the democratic method of a free and impartial plebiscite. The UN Security Council reiterated the right to self-determination to the people of Kashmir in various resolutions, including that of 1951 and 1957. On top of Kashmir-specific UNSC resolutions, the principal and fundamental right to self-determination is firmly established in international law. India's first prime minister, Mr. Jawaharlal Nehru pledged free exercise of Kashmiri's right to self-determination on many occasions. On November 25, 1947, Nehru informed the Indian parliament, we have suggested when people of Kashmir are given a chance to decide their future, this should be done under the supervision of an impartial tribunal such as the United Nations. The real face of India needed to be exposed at all international fora. The grave situation in Indian-occupied Jammu and Kashmir demands attention of Security Council to implement the resolutions. Since Kashmir issue is nuclear flashpoint between Pakistan and India, a war between both nuclear states may have a far-reaching effects and repercussions for the entire world. that it was India which approached
Welcome back to World This Morning, ladies and gentlemen. With me, I have Shazad Khan. <laughs> I am Shaza Hashmi. And today, while definitely it is an absolutely important day for uh, not just Pakistanis, but uh, for our Kashmiri brethren as mm. well. Today happens to be the day for, uh, you know, right, right to self-determination for Kashmiris. Or Yom Haq Ke Khud Radi. Yeah, absolutely. And they've been uh, observing this day. We have been observing this day with them for more than 70 years now. And I, I think at this moment, we really hope and pray, inshallah, inshallah, uh, justice is served, definitely. And they do get to exercise their right to self-determination. And but I would like to kind of remind the narrative <coughs> once again as well, because <coughs> Ms. Sundas Malik actually kind of made a lot of sense that mm. it is the process of Pakistan independence which is still incomplete and inshallah ladies and gentlemen will make sure uh, with a lot of prayers to Allah Almighty and everybody coming together as well for all of those people within the Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir as well that inshallah this process will be completed and every single day whenever we get the opportunity we'll be right here to voice our concerns about it. Of, of course without a doubt. But Shazad, before we did go out on a short break, you mentioned a very uh, interesting narrative to it, rather perspective as well, because when we talk about education, literacy for that matter, I think it's natural to understand research shows us that literacy will bring a sort of um, change in the generations to come, in the societies that you already exist in. Yeah. And that change is necessarily going to be good for the good of mankind, for the good of humankind, and for the good of the region where you operate in right now. Exactly. So talking about literacy and and education. I do remember, Shazad, this was probably last year, the first time we, we did this particular show. There were really tiny humanoids on our table. <laughs> And they were, well, robots, but they were performing so many functions. It was, it was the first time I was witnessing yeah. it and we were operating it and whatnot. So we were really excited to learn how Pakistan is actually, you know, sort of going further in that particular field. Mm. And remember last time, I think we left the show about how even students at a younger age or, you know, uh, in the primary schools, even for secondary that matter, need to hop on to this education system where, well, STEM education exactly. is a part of this. So exactly. Exactly. And, and, you know, Shaza, in addition to that, I think what I would like to remind everybody is that, you know, the technological interventions taking place all over the globe is something that, that Pakistan really needs to hop on to yeah. or probably learn that skill. So we have our Pakistan's uh, Elon Musk over here mm -hmm. in the studio today who actually makes sure that he's going to impart education on such a level and very holistically yeah. that people will learn because he says that STEAM education can actually help and is the kind of education which everybody wants in the 21st century and when we talk about STEAM it's actually science, technology, engineering, arts and mathematics and the Pakistan's Elon Musk over here in the studios <laughs> with us ladies and gentlemen happens to be the chief executive officer of Robotmia and he is Mr. Sayyid Burhan Ali. Hello, Assalamu Alaikum, good morning. Walaikum Assalam and very good morning to, to everyone. And thank you very much for inviting me again. And it always gives me, you know, it's like, uh, uh, it, it's a great pleasure. Bro, we want it. You know, we, this yeah. is the kind of pleasure we want as well, where even we are making robots, you know, we are in line with the kind of technology the world is producing. Because we cannot just produce crops and be the richest uh, economy. I think what we really need to do is that we really need to hop onto the bus where we kind of have our own configurations to all of the technological interventions, which is why, why do you think STEAM is important in the 21st century? And STEAM, ladies and gentlemen, is an education process. Please go ahead. You know, we, we, we need to understand one thing, that uh, now we are living in a new world. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it is the technology that has disrupted everything. Hmm. And uh, since technology has disrupted everything, so and I, I always say that school as a nursery has a direct connection with industry. But unfortunately, the, you know, the, the gap, which is school, no and link. then at the same time, I, I would say the education industry or academia industry gap is like uh, it's going big, big and big True. every day. Because we are not realizing that we are living in a new world. We are not realizing that technology, I mean, the world has seen enormous technological transformation in the last few decades. Yeah. And education is not actually going hand in hand. This is something very, understand, very important to understand. Especially and in COVID, it wasn't really. Wow. And, in, and there were, you know, there were so many lessons even for us uh, during during the COVID time. And the I, again, I would say that the the impacts or the you know the the repercussions of this COVID have long lasting effects again on education because still we are not realizing. So it is the high time that we need to realize and we need to act really fast because uh, you know uh, the the demands are totally different when mm -hmm. when you know the demands are totally different in the current day and age. But we are not realizing that. 
Uh, but thanks to the, the vision of the current Prime Minister, Prime, uh, the Honorable Mr. Imran Khan, and uh, he, has, uh, he has got this realization, and he has taken a, 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 you know, a word which uh, Mr. Shafkat Mahmoodi always says, a game changer, which is mm -hmm. the, the integration of uh, subjects together. And uh, the idea is that, uh, you know, and I would like to quote uh, Dr. Atawar Rahman, uh, he said that pa we as a nation, we are living in somewhere in first and second industrial revolution. Right. And he well, is, the world you know, is in the fourth. And the world is in fourth, and huh? they're heading in, f in fifth yeah. indi industrial revolution. And the solution is that we simply need to just uh, leave second, third, and directly we go into the fourth. And this is what the current government has done. I think we could do that, yes. And they have done it. And uh, the, the, you know, the, the current project which uh, the government has started, which is knowledge-based, I mean, it's all about knowledge economy initiative, where right. the idea is to incorporate STEM and STEAM uh, in the schooling landscape. And this, uh, this is something which we are doing for the first time. And, uh, and uh, the impacts are wonderful. I mean, uh, we have had, uh, we have established the labs. And uh, now students, they're actually getting these kind of opportunities. We are actually, they're understanding and learning things by exposing, or simply we are exposing them through or right, on technologies, yeah. through a STEAM, a STEAM educational framework. Exactly. Because and you know, just that simple addition, Shiza, I know that you have a question, but I just wanted no to kind problem. of relate to what he said. And it's because of the fact that I feel bad about it. And I feel bad about it because, you know, earlier when our parents or grandparents used to go to school, I think the, the only remark they would have to pass on to us was, Tum log khush chahiye. you know, we were taught But the education criteria was pretty much the same. You know, so whether you're studying on a chair or probably on a tart on the ground as well, the books were the same as well. Now, imagine that the students who are our future generations will be studying something holistically and that to all the subjects being integrated together. Now, for us, you know, I think I just feel bad because I want to learn that too. You want to learn that too? Yeah. And then, you know, it also makes you question, how are you going to help your children learn the newer stuff? Because, of course, they need help, right? Yeah. Well, um, so which I feel like is a learning process for all of us. We all unlearn together, I think our generation and especially, again. and relearn the newer stuff. But uh, coming back to you, but you know, um, if you talk about it, what it makes sense is that in the curriculum, in the syllabus maybe, you are going to introduce newer courses, newer topics. Hmm. Um, I want you to explain it in detail, hmm. what you know, integrating STEAM into the normal education systems mean. Does that also mean if I go to a public school in my village far, far away, are they going to be studying the same thing as I am in Islamabad? Live if not, if, I mean, no, yeah. why not? If not, it's not fair. I mean, then we're not on the same page as well. Yeah. You know, the, the, the first of all, we need to understand that uh, it's, it's like a complete transformation. Like uh, the education has evolved, or I would say that it was the need of the first industrial revolution. Like we need to teach our students through, uh, you know, content specific culture, or I would say uh, through uh, subject silos. Okay, okay. Now from that subject silos, now the world is living in somewhere in integrative learning environment. Yeah. Where the idea is to, now the students, they, all, they are coming in their classrooms with lots of previous knowledge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now that is the role of a teacher. I would say that is the role of a new, uh, not just teacher, a mentor mm -hmm. uh, or a technology handler that he or she need to simply uh, understand one thing that it is very important that we need to link or combine knowledge, previous knowledge, with a skill set, which is very important. Now, skill is something which is missing. True. Now, uh, what the government has done, I mean, in, in, in the current uh, initiative which the government has taken, they are actually simply, uh, they have just transformed this educational system from the subject silos where we have been teaching science as a subject or mm. math as a subject or, you know, social studies, which is not or, even a course. Or the as a subject. Now, they have actually linked everything together and we have developed a complete amalgam. And there are three ways of implementing STEM yeah. across the world. S uh, West, they, have d uh, they are doing it differently, whereas East, East, they are doing differently. There is one- Just a little confused over here. You could just called it STEM. Don't you think that it's STEAM? It should be STEAM. It yeah. should be STEAM. You know, the but you guys refer to it as STEM? It's STEM because you know, it was one of the, uh, the most uh, important campaign, which Barack Obama, he actually yeah. initiated back in- Officially, it's called yeah. STEM. It's STEM, but the government of Pakistan, they have initiated STEAM, not STEM. Yeah. Because right. we have got Included the belief- Included arts in it. it. Including arts in it. Mm. Because we have got the belief that innovation is not possible without arts. Wow. Absolutely. And this is something very important. And when we say in our education system that it is basically uh, a total participation tool. So it is very important that art should be the part of it. I mean, this is something which is research-based and proven. Exactly. Uh, but why, sorry, Burhan, that I'm intercepting. And the reason over here is that, so what are you trying to, ref are you trying to refer to that, for example, how we went to a business school and, you know, studied marketing and did majors in it as well. So what you are referring to is that there will be a time where, you know, while I'll be studying marketing, I'll be actually looking into engineering as well and technology and everything. Don't you think there'll be too much to ask for that? Isn't it chaotic? Because no. I think that now is an era of 
being specialized rather than being jack of all trades? I agree with you. No, I mean, you know, the most important thing is that technology is basically, technology is something which has a link with everything. Oh now yeah, for example, I, let, let, let's talk about STEM, that well, how this STEM evolved. Yeah. Now we're living in 21st century and we're preparing the students for 22nd century. Yeah. And uh, I just want to quote one thing that... Do you think that's too far-fledged, you know? I no, don't know whether we're going you know, to survive for another century or not. Yeah. No, this is something which we need to realize. Okay. 85% of the jobs which will exist after 2030 have not been invented yet. And this okay. is the question. Obviously, now, For yes. what we are actually producing these students. Now, we are living in 21st century. And for, for, for understanding, uh, let's say, science, we need the help of technology. Now, to understand technological developments or, let's say, technological innovations or inventions in the classroom environment, so we can actually link it with, with of course, with the environment we live in, we have to have capstan projects, which is totally engineering. So that means engineering should be the part and parcel of the classroom. True. Mm. And then to doing all this, you have to have the understanding of logic. All right. So you need math plus coding programming skills. So that means in everything, whatever you, wherever mm -hmm. you go, technology is something which needs to go hand in hand, and we need to understand. Yeah, that. I mean, Absolutely, that's and wonderful. Very sorry, but you know, so just so you know that audiences out there actually have a very clear mindset. So are you referring to that? For example, if I went into an MBBS school, you know, or a medical school, so people can come to me, maybe anything they, they feel is wrong with their kidney or heart or brain or probably with their teeth. So I'll be the dentist, I'll be the urologist, and I'll be the um, you know oncologist as well. Is that what you're referring to? Of course, yes. I mean, now, the population's uh, increasing. Let everybody do one job at a time, yeah? No, I think so that know, they can actually do their job. You know, we, we, now we need to produce uh, learners, yeah. and we need to produce people with uh, who has got the expertise in non-routine jobs, not in routine jobs. All right. Now, s robots and AI, it's, they are going to displace almost 70, 75 to up to 85 uh, 85 million jobs mm. in the next 10 years. Yeah. But at the same time, these new technologies, the emerging technologies are going to produce 133 million new jobs, which is the net positive thing. But you're not talking about the how many jobs they're going to take away as well. You know, it's I think it's 75, I mean, into se it well. 75 yeah. million or 85 million. Yeah. That means the routine jobs will be eliminated. Now, we don't need to produce people who, who has the ability of doing repetitive tasks. Rather, we need to produce people who are good problem solvers. Like mm. the, the idea is that it is the high time that we have, we need to develop a total a different skill set. True. For example, agility is something we were talking about uh, uh, in Kashmir. Yeah. You know, the point is in this, especially in this part of the world, we need to teach agility. Mm -hmm. We need to teach flexibility. We need to teach communication. We need to teach leadership. We need to teach, I mean, innovation, entrepreneurship, technological transformation, because we want to produce thought leaders. We want to produce technological uh, te technology entrepreneurs. So for producing them, it is very important that we need to change the classroom environment so we produce something different in the future. Absolutely, you're right, and thank you so much for saying that, and thank you so much for being a part of our show again. Thank uh, you. I totally agree with you where coding and, you know, mathematics, the basics of it should be a part of um, all the education system, True. especially. We should learn from our neighbors as well. They have already inculcated this system. And starting from sixth grade, it is compulsory for all students there to study coding. Well, I hope one day I get to learn it as well. But ladies and gentlemen, this is definitely the way forward. While the entire world is uh, heading into the fifth um, industrial revolution, I really hope and pray that we hop on to it uh, at the same time too. Inshallah. Um, till the next time, take care, please. We'll see you tomorrow at the same time, inshallah. And the repeat you can catch at 5 past midnight. Till take the next time, look after yourselves. One, two, three. Good, Good morning. morning. Very short in time.